George Benton had nowhere to go. He grew up in a family of 11 children. With apartments too small and packed to stay inside, the young George spends his youth on the streets of Philadelphia. Even then, the city of brotherly love had its seedy side. Kids would walk to school in groups to protect themselves from street gangs that would rob whoever they could. The ability to defend yourself was massively important in such a hostile environment. At age eight, George steps into the gym for the first time. George Benton was a boxing genius. He believed that finesse in fighting is what happens before and after a punch is thrown. It's all the little details that don't show up on a highlight reel that make one possible. The devil was in the details. For nearly two decades, George was one of the best middleweights in the world. It's 1955, and Benton is making a push for a title shot. He's 31, 2, and 1, and he can't get a fight. Even a returning Sugar Ray Robinson opted not to fight him. Before a deal could be made for a title shot, George's number came up. He's drafted by the U.S. Army. He becomes coach of the boxing team and ends up teaching his tricks to a generation of servicemen while his actual career was on hold. He returns to the States and resumes his career, but the time off took something out of him. After picking up a couple of losses to elite competition, George gets in his groove and goes on a long winning streak. Benton has finally broken into the national fight picture and he has established himself as a definite threat in the middleweight division. In 1960, he beats his first of three future champions when he decisioned Freddie Little. A year later, he beats number two contender Joey Giardello. Middleweight champion Dick Tiger fought Giardello instead and lost. George never got another crack at Joey, but by the mid-60s, film of his full fights start turning up. In 1963, he takes on Reuben Hurricane Carter. Five. Round one. Scoring here in the interference on the Saturday Night Fight TV in the white, thereby inability to get opponents sometimes. For the first time, we get to see the man, Ray Robinson's manager, didn't want. George Benton moves like liquid gold. He was slender with a dancer's balance. He fainted beautifully and hit with respectable power. There's always a certain section of fans who look back at old boxers and think they were craftless cavemen. Those people aren't talking about George. And there it is, the most elegant Philly shell defense this side of the millennium. The low lead hand both protects the body and disguises his leads on offense because they came from below an opponent's field of vision. The high power hand, prepare to catch the jab in the palm or take a hook on the glove or to be thrown short and straight with sneaky power. The right defends the body shot with a slight lean but the bread and butter of the Philly shell is the shoulder roll. With a low lead hand passively defending the body, responsibility for defending the head relies on distance and the proper timing of the shoulder roll. 
Notice how Benton is slightly leaned off to his right side. This allows him to duck his way under a left hook much easier. It shaves milliseconds off when getting low. Milliseconds in boxing is the difference between trapped and free. Benton looks like an experienced veteran with a man a weight class heavier. Ruben was a tank. And George refused to run from him. He stood right in the pocket and fought him. The final round was an all-out war that saw both hurt. cards come up, and George is given a loss that neither man really deserved. A year later, Benton would decision Jimmy Ellis at 160 pounds. In 1968, Ellis would go on to win the heavyweight championship from Jerry Quarry. It was 1970, and his sister had been accosted by a man at a bar. Benton's older brothers threw a beating on that man. The man returned in a rage and determined to kill one Benton or another. The first Benton he saw was George. The bullet was buried too deep and too close to his spine to be removed. George carried that bullet from a man he never met for the rest of his life. His final record was 61, 13, and 1. He was 8 and 2 in his last 10 fights. Never knocked out. Never knocked down. Never got a title shot in a career that spanned two decades. George couldn't fight anymore, but ever since the Army, George's role in the gym was half a coach anyway. After the shooting, George threw all his effort and intellect into becoming a trainer. He apprenticed himself to the great Eddie Futch, who soon saw Benton as essential enough to bring him into Joe Frazier's corner. He's there across the ring from Muhammad Ali for the legendary Thrilla in Manila. George's reputation grew, and eventually he gets a promotion. He developed a working partnership with Lou Duva. Duva was a manager and promoter who for years sought out world-class talent from around the globe. He's also the man who managed to get Joey Giardello his ill-earned title shot all those years ago. He admitted to screwing George out of his shot, but George held no ill will. To make up for it, Duva made George an offer he couldn't refuse. Benton became the head trainer of Lou's stable of fighters. This put a generation of greats in touch with one of the most brilliant boxing minds put on planet Earth. If you had a question, George had an answer. He trained champions of every weight and style the same fundamentals. It was a matter of personal choice what the fighters did with it. the strangest. From suffocating pressure fighters like Evander Holyfield, and Rocky Lockridge. to the most brilliant boxers, like Mike McCallum.
Meldrick Taylor. And the man he called his masterpiece, Purnell Sweet P. Whitaker. Buck Whitaker with a few punches again. Whitaker in the corner. He was in Leon Spinks' corner when he beat Muhammad Ali. He was in Evander's corner when he beat Buster Douglas. He was named Trainer of the Year two years running for 1989 and 1990. For a short while there, after the death of Eddie Futch, you could probably call him the best trainer in boxing. Influence can be a difficult thing to quantify, especially in the modern era where all the world can see any fighter they want with the tap of a few keys. As national styles refine every year into more individual ones, the root of genius gets buried with each passing decade. But all of humanity was built by standing on the shoulders of giants. It was the grace of his movement and sharpness of his intellect that inspired and enabled his students to achieve the greatness he never got the chance to. George Benton's boxing brain was essential to building the fundamental foundation that underpinned a generation of champions. Influence is difficult to quantify, but you can see a bit George Benton in almost everybody nowadays. The Philly shell surely predates George Benton by hundreds or thousands of years. The concepts that underpin it were winning fistfights long before cameras existed. But the Philly shell wasn't the Philly shell until George Benton got to it.